alaikum and happy Sabbath. Uh, this is uh, Seventh day Adventist Church, Fifth Ngong Avenue, Nairobi, Kenya, where we are bringing you a very, very important lesson discussion, or rather Bible study, on a very critical topic for Christians to understand about Jesus, who is our high priest. Before we move on, I could wish to bring forth the lesson discussion panelists, or the Bible study panelists, uh, from my far left is our brother Samuel Methuselah, who will say hi to the congregation. Hi. Welcome, Samuel. Next to me is uh, our sister Jada. Jamie, I call her JJ, who will also say hi to the congregation. Hi. To my right is our elder Boas Munga, who will also say hi to the church. Hi, church. Thank you very much, elder. Um, I will request Sister Jeda uh, to do an opening prayer, but before she does that, it's me, your host, Elder Paul Momani, uh, leading this discussion this morning. Uh, Jeda, you may lead us in the opening prayer of the discussion. Karibu. Shall you pray? Our kind and loving Father, we are humbled this morning for the gift of life, for the strength and energy you've given us this morning. Lord, as we want to worship you, we want to discuss the lesson. We pray that your Holy Spirit may lead us through, may help us understand, and may lead us to salvation. This is our prayer of faith, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we move on, members in the sanctuary, I... I'm asked to request you to join our various uh, classes within the auditorium. Kindly join uh, your various classes because we shall be uh, learning or studying with the online church from the upfront from the pulpit. Join your various classes and make sure you join a class with the least people. Uh, be as small groups as possible for a better discussion. Thank you. Um, this is a wonderful study this morning on Jesus, the faithful priest. And uh, we are here today to share what we have learned about it, I'm sure uh, this discussion or that this this lesson is uh, with many people. Um, we have all gone through it, and maybe others have not, and that's why we are here to discuss. Why a high priest? Why Jesus? And why the priest to be among the people? That's the question we want to answer this morning, and after that, probably we shall be knowing exactly why Jesus came as our high priest. A priest, as per the explanation given, is a mediator between sinful, uh, sinners, uh, sinful people and God. Is the person who is mediating, is, is like uh, bridging the gap between God and, and the sinful man. That's why we have priests and members of was rather I sin is the one that caused all these things. Let me let me outline a few things that sin caused. Sin caused the gulf between God and man. Sin also corrupted man's nature of submission to God's will. Sin also separated us from God. Sin made it impossible for man to obey God and his, his law. 
sin caused a, a misunderstanding between man and God. Sin made us lose a significant, uh, lose, uh, sin made us lose sight of the love and mercy of God. That is what sin caused. Hence, need for, need for a high priest or rather for a priest. Brothers and sisters, I wish to um, I wish to request our sister Jeda to take us through on uh, this part uh, saying why a priest on, on behalf of human beings? Why a priest among or on behalf of human beings? Jeda, why, why a priest? Why did we need a priest? Having outlined the cause of the sin, or rather what, what, what sin caused, why did we need a priest among human beings? Jeda. Thank you very much, Elder. Uh, one of the reasons why we needed a priest so much was because we needed a person who could mediate between us sinners and God. And so we are going to read uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 1 through 10. And from there, from there, from that passage, we'll be able to understand the roles of a priesthood and... Uh, we'll be able to understand how Jesus covered all those roles of a priesthood. Uh, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 through 10. I'll read some portions, not all of it, but in your free time you can go and check. Uh, first, we have understood that one of the roles of the priesthood was to mediate between us sinful people and God. And uh, we understand in... Hebrews chapter 5 verse 5 that Jesus Jesus will read Hebrews 5 verse 5 so also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest but he that said unto him thou art my son today have I begotten thee so priests were appointed by God as ministers and they were to be mediating humans to God and one of the qualities they needed to have was that they were supposed to show mercy and they were supposed to be understanding. They were supposed to show mercy in that we are human beings and we are prone to falling. And for someone to come to you and tell you that it is okay, it's our nature, but there is this higher way where we can look to Christ and we can call to him and we can confess our sins and he can he'll forgive us. That is one of the things that, as a priest, you are supposed to be having. Um, in Hebrews, also 5, 7, 8, we are going to read, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication, with strong crying and tears unto him that he was able to save, to save him from death, and was hard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So one of the things that we learn from Jesus as our priest is that Jesus was a sovereign king. He was obeyed by men. But now he coming to earth as our, as our savior, he had to live a lowly life, a life of obedience. And he as a king had to learn obedience. And we are learning that through his life, through his life of obedience, and through his death, we are, we are saved. Uh, Jesus, uh, he was not chosen among men. That is in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 1 where it says, For every priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices to God. But Jesus was God and he was not taken from from men. He was God and he came to earth in form of a man, in form of a human being. 
inheriting all the shortcomings of human beings. For in Hebrews 4, 5, it says that we have not an high priest which cannot be, let us just read, we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was at all points tested, but as we are, but he was without sin. And so Jesus was um, a sinless high priest. You know, other priests were human. And one of the things that we human have is that we sin. Our nature is of sin. And so when they went to atone for people of God, they had to repent their sins first before they could, uh, atone, before they could atone to other, other people's sin. But Jesus, he lived a perfect life, a sinless, sinless life. And so his duty as our high priest was just to atone for us sinful men. And uh, in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 7, 26 to uh, 28, Hebrews 7, 26, 28, we'll read, it says, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests, to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. And uh, um, one of the things that we learned from Jesus as a priest of human beings was that he was merciful. You know, from creation, God had already set up a plan for our salvation. And it took mercy. It took mercy as Christ himself, Lord himself, came to earth, lived the life of men, went through tribulation, and was, was despised. In Isaiah, it describes how, how Jesus' Jesus's life on earth was, and it was just a lowly life. And he, he agreed to undergo through all that so that we may have salvation in him through his perfect life, life of obedience, and then through his life. And at the end, um, the lesson writer poses a question that is in uh, uh, in accordance to second um, um, in second okay, sorry. It poses a question that what does Jesus' life tell us about our relationship with other human beings? Should be because we are in this sacred role. So in uh, our life as human beings, in the book of, let me just find it. Oh, good. The verse that talks us the, the, the verse does, that describes us as royal priesthoods and uh, holy nation, it's second? It's first, first, Peter. first Peter chapter 2 verses okay. 9. Thank you. It says, uh, First Peter 2 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, po a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him, who has called you unto us, who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So the le le lesson writer poses a question that according to that verse, what does the life of Jesus as our intercessor tell us about our relationship with our human beings? How should our relationship with the human be because of this sacred role? And we learn that um, Jesus as our intercessor encourages us. The Bible itself says that we are supposed to be intercessors for others. We should be praying for others. We should be interceding on behalf of others. And we can see this in the book of Daniel chapter 9, where Daniel um, went and interceded on behalf of the people. Ezra also in, uh, in the times of the Israelites, when he went and uh, found out that the the Israel, there had been intermarriages and the worshipping of the false idols. Ezra pulled off his beards and he 
he repented to God and he cried out to God. And it was not like he was the one who did this, but his people had done it. And he felt the need of going to God in, in, on behalf of the people. And so as Christians, the sacred role that we have in in our lives today is that we should intercede for our friends, intercede for our family, intercede for our children, because that is the that is the role that Jesus is doing for us up in heaven. Thank you, Jada, uh, for taking us through that very grateful uh, part of the lesson. And we have uh, come to understand uh, that, yes, uh, the priests were chosen among men. And uh, one of the things that have come out clearly through that uh, explanation is that uh, the earthly or Levitical priests were human and they, they, they were making mistakes just like any other person and they were mortal apart I mean, uh, they, um, unlike Jesus um, who had the same attributes just like the earthly um, priests or Levitical priests but the difference here is that Jesus was not chosen by man or other men Jesus was chosen by God himself and he also had the same attributes and even more uh, um, or more than the, uh, the Levitical um, priests. The, uh, the attributes I'm talking about here is mercifulness and understanding of human weaknesses. Jesus understood us better because he, he stayed with us here on earth. He lived with us and understood us and he even went ahead and as a, as a priest died for our sins. Um, Elder Boaz, in the order of Melchizedek, in the order of Melchizedek, I wish that you will help us understand who was this Melchizedek, who Melchizedek was and how was he related to Jesus, or rather in relation to Jesus. Welcome. Thank you, Elder. Um... I would like to begin by saying uh, something about in the order of Melchizedek. In the order of Melchizedek, the first time I read it, I wondered. But I came to understand this simply means resembling Melchizedek or similar to the priesthood of Melchizedek. And this Melchizedek we are talking about was first introduced in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verse 18 to 20. Uh, to 20. And we see that... Uh, the first thing we notice, we will notice, is that he has many similarities with Jesus Christ himself. And that is what I'll try to dwell on as I try to say who Melchizedek, Melchizedek was. So in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20, and in fact even in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 1 to 3, Melchizedek is both a king and a priest. And he's a king of a place called Salem. And... Uh, if you read Psalm 76, verse 1 and 2, Salem is the same as Jerusalem. Uh, Hebrews translates Salem as peace. So uh, Melchizedek, is, uh, the name itself refers to king of righteousness. And he also can be called king of peace. And we, quickly when you look at this, when you hear king of righteousness again, the ultimate king of righteousness becomes Christ himself. Then, uh, so we, st we begin to st start seeing some similarity between Melchizedek and, and Jesus Christ at that point. Now, Paul, <coughs> let me say before I go to Paul, that Jesus is also a king through the line of David. And Jesus himself is also a priest in the likeness of Melchizedek. And that we can see very clearly. Then Paul uses the little information that we have about Melchizedek to create a type of Christ. Uh, and uh, although we look at uh, the writings of Paul in Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3, you see that Melchizedek is represented by Paul as if he is eternal. By, when Paul says in that verse, he is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor the end of life. This verse has created a lot of controversy and uh, many suggest that could this Mel Melchizedek then be a heavenly being? If you look at these qualities, actually, they are qualities that they belong to, to God himself. But uh, the evidence that we have is that Paul says, no, he is not really a heavenly being. Because that verse, 
say says he is like Christ it is not saying he is Christ and then if you look at Hebrews 7:11 uh, Paul brings another argument that if he was a heavenly being and we say he is either God or Christ then that means we already have had a perfect priesthood then there'll be no need to have another priest that says Paul uh, in reference to the Levitical system he says we need another perfect priest because the Levitical, the Levitical priesthood is not perfect. It is those priests who are chosen among men who was faultly, uh, faulty as us. Those animals they sacrificed could not deal with sin permanently or legally. Only Christ could deal with sin. So Paul argues that the, uh, that, uh, the perfect one comes much later, so the earlier Melchizedek cannot be a perfect word, uh, cannot, be, cannot be Christ or, or God. Then, uh, if we look at both Melchizedek and Jesus, we notice quickly from verse 3 still that uh, their priesthood does not emanate from a certain genealogy, unlike the Levitical system that we know. So, Jesus. In fact, Jesus' priesthood is established by an oath. And you can get that from Psalms 110 verse 4. I'll uh, read part of it. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This Psalms 110 is taken as a, a prophecy of the coming Messiah. And it is suggesting that the priesthood of Christ, priesthood of Christ was, came about as an oath not from a certain genealogy. So, so we see also some similarity between the priesthood of Melchizedek and that of Christ, for we don't, we don't know the, the genealogy of Melchizedek. I think Elder will agree with me. Then that means we should be grateful to God for giving us very little information about Melchizedek, which has made it, made it feasible for Paul to use it, to use Melchizedek's priesthood as a type of Christ. If we knew the father of Melchizedek, we could not use his priesthood as a type of Christ. I think uh, that is something that uh, 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 we should appreciate. Then <clears throat> the other issue is uh, the question whether is Melchizedek Jesus or a pre-incarnate of Christ? That's a common question. Uh, I think that was, uh, I referred to that earlier when I said that in verse 3, uh, Paul is saying, he remains a priest forever, resembling the Son of God. That is the New Living Translation. So he's, he's referred to as resembling the Son of God, rather than being the Son of God. If you look at the King James Version, but made like unto the Son of God. He is just like the Son of God, but not him. So it's different from the Son of, uh, from Jesus. I think that is uh, something that uh, is, is, has been controversial. Then uh, the other point I would like to bring out quickly is... Um, the priesthood of Melchizedek, there's an argument that it is superior to the priesthood we see from Lev, the tribe of Levi and Aaron. Uh, and Paul brings out, Paul really struggles to bring out this issue. Yeah, and he uses many, uh, many words to, uh, to, to explain it. How is it superior? He refers to Genesis uh, 14, where we, uh, we read, verse, uh, verses 7 and 8, that... Uh, verses 18 and 20, uh, Paul suggests that number one, we see Abraham being blessed by Melchizedek. And the blessings, Paul argues, blessings come from what? A superior person. He uses the word lesser. So Abraham has to, had to be lesser than Melchizedek for him to receive blessings from Melchizedek. Then number two, uh, although I don't know whether Paul also brings out this, uh, Melch uh, we see Melchizedek receiving tithe from Abraham. So that means Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. Then where does Levi come from? Levi, come fr Levi comes from the genealogy of Abraham himself. So given that Levi comes from the genealogy of Abraham, Paul argues it is as if the, the Levites are paying uh, tithes to, to Melchizedek through Abraham. It is, also as, uh, is, it is also true that they are receiving blessings from Melchizedek through Abraham. So uh, Melchizedek has to be too superior. 
and his priesthood will be superior to the Levitical system. And then he says, <coughs> that points to the superiority of the priesthood of Christ himself. It is like that one of Melchizedek. It is not based on genealogy, but established by an author. And that, I think, uh, uh, Elder brings uh, quite a, uh, a, strong, a strong argument uh, for, and, and, and enables us to understand the weight of the priesthood of Jesus Christ himself. I think um, Paul is suggesting then that we do not need this Levitical priesthood line. We need something more superior. And this something more superior, we see it exemplified by Melchizedek. And uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, like Melchizedek himself, does not need a genealogy. But unlike Melchizedek now, Christ is from everlasting to everlasting. And that, I think, uh, uh, marks uh, <clears throat> what, what I would like, wish to say about Melchizedek and, uh, and Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen, amen. Thank you, Elder, uh, for, for that clarification. And you brought it very, out very clearly that indeed Melchizedek was not Jesus Christ. Uh, he resembled Jesus Christ in many aspects. But uh, Jesus was more superior uh, than Melchizedek because Jesus is eternal. He was appointed by God himself. And um, uh, he did not even require to give um, a sacrifice for himself uh, before giving a sacrifice for men. So it is clear here, Elder, that uh, indeed Jesus was more superior than Melchizedek. As we move on, um, viewers... I want now to move to our brother Samuel. Samuel, uh, I, I ask that you bring out um, Jesus as the effective priest. And this then poses a question. Were the Levitical priests not effective? And if not, um, why, were no, why, why were they not effective, as effective as Jesus Christ? And um, um, why was the need for another priest, a higher priest? Because we had priests before. You remember? In, the, in times of Abraham, we had priests. In times of um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the desert, we had priests. Why did, we, why did we need a priest who is more effective than others? Uh, I think in that part, you can be able to, uh, to, to handle that clearly. Uh, Sami. Yes, thank you, Elder, for the opportunity. Uh, Christ, as an effective priest, I would like to re, uh, just pick from the same lesson. If you read the third line of the lesson, uh, uh, before I get there, uh, I, I would like to put it this way, that when Christ, uh, we were having priests before, but there was ref a reflection of what God had desired for human and even for the salvation of man then being in the human form we are prone to sin and within ourselves we cannot conquer the sin so even the priests who were there before were in the same state mortal now the need for a, an effective priest back then for you to be cleansed of your sin you had to take a lamb animal sacrifice that is uh, in order for them to go. And while they went, after they had done the sacrifices, they too had to come back and cleanse themselves. But when Christ comes, he comes as the lamb, as written in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 9, when he walks towards John, he says, Behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And if you read up, from uh, the first part, it says, Nor could the animals' sacrifices cleanse the conscience of the sinner. Meaning, in as much as they are priest, but it could not completely cleanse to a state of sinfulness. Then, their purpose was to point forward to the ministry of Jesus and his sacrifice, which alone 
could provide true cleansing from all sin. So then the coming of Christ makes it becomes effective that now we transition from taking animals to the temple, from having priests, but rather now we go to Christ who is the f ultimate lamb, the ultimate sacrifice for our sins to be saved so that we who are human can be again reunited to God. That is only if we believe and follow in the footsteps of who? Of Jesus. So if we look at it from that angle, I think that is what really makes Christ outstanding and effective because he is also one with God. He is God himself. And the law, there is a way the law dealt with man and he himself is the law. So when he comes as the ultimate sacrifice, the effectiveness as a priest whose role is to mediate being tempted like we are, he has the experience, but in him we find total uh, relief or we, we get relieved from all our burdens because he is God. He is the law. And back then there were laws. So when he is from the point of his death, from the point of his re resurrection, Christ becomes the final lamb upon which our salvation now lies and uh, from the same point being the law he brings it better now we are saved by grace in him and hence we have to pray through him for us to get to that point yes by, sorry, this can be taken up by any one of us. When, when, uh, when Jesus came as the high priest, a law was changed. When I, were, I was going through the lesson, a law was changed. Uh, when you go through the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 11 to 16, there is a law that was changed. Um, Elder or any Jedi, any one of us can, can outline, can tell us which law was changed when Jesus came as a high priest in regard to uh, the Levitical priests yes and you know the priests were coming from a certain genealogy, a certain line lineage uh, then what was to change here? something changed so, so Elder, you, actually have, you have begun uh, giving a hint to where the answer should be yes Elder uh, because uh, the only change we are seeing is that there was uh, there were laws that were given by Moses regarding who can be a priest, and uh, we know that priests had to come from a certain tribe, the tribe of Levi, and they were through the uh, through the lineage of Aaron himself. And uh, if you look at your Bible quickly, the people were tempted to become uh, to do the priestly roles, not even to become priests, to do the roles of priests. You remember King Uzziah. He tried to go to the, uh, to the temple and actually uh, 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 do the role of a priest using the incense. What happened to him? He got leprosy. And uh, we have other examples of, of cases. Even, even Saul, to some extent, even just attempted to sacrifice. And uh, that was a priestly role. You remember Samuel, uh, Samuel uh, told him, no, this is not for you. So we see that uh, there was a very strict law on who could become a priest. And it's very interesting that Paul is talking to Hebrews who understand this law very well. So Hebrews can ask themselves, how is then Christ a priest? So Paul has to give an answer. And Paul says, we need to change the law. Not that we need to change the law, but the law was changed. Paul is actually saying the law was changed. It is no longer a matter of genealogy. It's a matter of priesthood on the basis of an oath. And it is similar to the priesthood that we see in Melchizedek. So thank God for the existence of, existence of Melchizedek who allows Paul to say, look here, don't look at this genealogy thing. It's much higher. The priesthood of Christ needed a change in law and the law has changed and now it becomes through an oath. That, amen. Yeah. Thank you, Elder, for even bringing out more clearer. As we move on, um, I'm seeing something called indestructible life. 
the, in other words, a life that you cannot manage to distract, it is indestructible. Um, which life is this? And we are talking about eternal priests. What connection is there between eternal priests and this word I'm seeing, eternal ministry, indestructible life? Uh, Sami, what, what is this are we hearing here about internal priesthood? Uh, thank you once again. Uh, reading through the life of who God is, picking it from the point of uh, being a member of the Godhead, he was one when the foundations were being laid. Then he takes the form of man in order for the plan of salvation to be fulfilled. So then when he comes, yes, he is still God, but he comes in as a human being who can be tempted, who can also face challenges, but still carries on through suffering without, he still manages to remain blameless, and sinless. Hence, if I look at the indestructible, and there's a word I, I, I loved there, to the utmost. If, if we can just read that verse uh, that uh, talks about uh, to the utmost, that should be Hebrews you can read for us. 7, yes, 25. Hebrews 7, 5 says, And verily, they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. So then, what was very critical, that when Christ took this form of the human nature, he imprinted the laws of God in our hearts bringing yet a better way than the one we have studied, the Levitical one that was existing. So then it brings us to this point where the law is in our hearts and him being made perfect through the suffering, through the afflictions, he is made perfect. And if you read that part, therefore he is able to save to the utmost, meaning to the final extent of salvation that if we believe in him so what makes him eternal one he is one with God and he conquers sin that through all the things he goes through he still remains sinless and besides remaining sinless he makes life or the law to be written in our heart in order for the plan of salvation. And then there's the class that leaves us and says that if we now believe in the teachings of this same Jesus, then we are able to be saved through him for salvation. And I think there are so many points. I can see my elder there. I know he must be having a word to share on the same uh, aspect of Christ. Yes. Maybe I'll pose a question here, which can be handled uh, by anyone. Anyone was. When uh, the Le Levitical priests were being appointed by by God, they served for a period of time, and others then were appointed after their service ended. May maybe either by death or maybe by by something something that may happen for them to cease to be priests that's when they can uh, another priest can be appointed now um, after Jesus came as the high priest um, do we have another priest coming up after him or Jesus is the priesthood is eternal it's a straightforward question. Maybe any one of us can answer. Yes, I can see. I can see Jada. Okay, thank you. Um, 
In the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, priests would come and they would be their successors, right? Yes. And Melchizedek, I think, featured twice in the Old Testament. There was, the Bible does not give us who was before him or who was after him. And we learned that he was a type of Christ. And so after the order of Melchizedek, and which people said uh, that he was, uh, he was like Christ, but what was wrong? Why couldn't just why couldn't it just be final? Why could the order of priests end with Melchizedek? And so Jesus came in, and after Jesus, there was no need for other priesthood because Jesus offered his life and. From his death, we are able to approach the throne of grace. And we know that he's happy in heaven, interceding on our behalf. And that is why there is no need, there is no need, there is no service needed from the priests anymore. Because Jesus has taken it up all and is doing that duty up in heaven. There is no other priest coming after Jesus. Amen. Uh, yes, yes, Sam. Just to read a line that is in the lesson. Uh, uh, in the first paragraph of that uh, day, Wednesday, mm. it says, the salvation that Jesus provides is total and final. Meaning that after what Jesus has done as a priest for us, then there remaineth no other except that which he has already done. Makes it final and makes it Eternal. If you read, it reaches the inmost aspect of our human nature that we can also find in Hebrew. Hence, for him to still remain eternal, as you put it, Elder, Christ, having redeemed us and having saved us and him being reconnected back to divinity, there is now no need or we don't anticipate another priest to come in the name of a savior but we only have one true savior whom i believe all of us are waiting for to come yes. he is the high priest. Yes. jesus christ thank you um there's something concerning the covenant and you know uh we had the old covenant and we have the new covenant and the, the new covenant of course is uh, the covenant of, uh, of uh, god through christ jesus and um, there's a very, uh, very wonderful statement here uh, that I want to read also before we go to the final part of this uh, discussion. In the case of the Son, however, Jesus Christ, life is indestructible. The oath God made to him will be binding forever. A person who stood in surety or a guarantee of another was liable to the same penalties as the person for whom he stood in surety. So, how do you understand this statement, um, Elder? Yes, the statement goes, um, a person who stood in surety or guarantee of another was liable to the same penalties as the person for whom he stood in surety, including death. Sam, do you understand anything about, about this statement? Yes. Uh, let me put it this way, that uh, Jesus is the surety. We were to die, but Jesus died on our behalf. And he died once and for all. As the statement uh, uh, Sam read at the beginning up there, that uh, it was the total, it was, uh, Jesus provided a total and final uh, salvation. To all mankind. So Jesus is our surety. Is our surety. As we come to the end of the lesson. Elder, maybe before we come there. Yes. There is a line Some. after that statement you just read. Yes. That says, yet the father established Jesus as a guarantee to us that he will not default on his promises. Mm -hmm. Meaning as we deal with Christ, we are dealing with one who is not going to default. Mm. He is one who is going to stand to the very end of time without changing. Mm. 
I, I think that was a very serious point. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let us move on uh, to the last part of this discussion. Viewers, we have seen an eternal priest and now we want to see a sinless priest. Jesus, we are told, was sinless and indeed as much as he lived uh, within among men, he never sinned. The Bible says so. There are some characteristics attributed to Jesus Christ as the sinless priest. And these are the characteristics we look at, then come to the end of our discussion this morning. Um, JJ. We have about five characteristics listed here. I request that you take us through the first two characteristics. Okay. Of a sinless priest. Thank you, Elder. Um, the characteristics of Jesus as our sinless priest are found in the book of Hebrews, mm. chapter 7, verse 26, and it reads, For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, and defiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And I'll tackle the sinless priest as holy and undefiled. Well, when we talk about Jesus as holy, first of all, we need to understand that Jesus was without no fault. He was a pure as a human being. He was pure as a human being, and there was not any fault for, found between him and his relationship to God. And we can read from the book of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 18. Hebrews 2.18 says, for in, uh, for in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are, are tempted. And so in, in holiness of Christ, we are Christians and we are subject to sinning. But when be, we behold a holy Christ, who is able to save us from our nature of being tempted, we understand him as a holy, as a holy God, as a holy priest. The second attribute of Jesus, our, as our sinless priest, is that he is undefiled. Uh, Jesus remained pure, untouched by evil, and this was despite him being tempted in all points. As we had read earlier in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 that says that for we have an high priest which cannot be touched by for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like us yet was without sin. So Jesus was undefiled. And also uh, as we had read in Hebrews chapter 2 verses 18. Amen. What does Hebrews chapter 2, 18 say? Uh, we had read, and it says, For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that, that, are, that are tempted. There's a point that the lesson writer makes that I would love us to read, that Jesus' perfect sinless Jesus' perfect sinlessness is important for his priesthood. The old covenant stipulated that the sacrificial victims had to be without blemish to be acceptable to God. That is found in Levites, in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3 and 10. And uh, while, when in the old tabernacle, in the old sanctuary, when you are choosing an offering to present before the Lord for the atonement of your sins, for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll choose a, a lamb that was without blemish. And so it is important that we notice that God, Jesus was undefiled and he was without blemish. Amen. Our high priest Jesus 
is holy and undefiled. And what is is how, how what are the other char characteristics of the high priest Jesus Christ? Uh, apart from being holy and undefiled. Yes. Uh, this were read earlier, but we see that Jesus was uh, separated from sinners as one of his characteristics, which brings to, to which brought out two ideas, uh, two concepts that is perfectly sinless, as we see in Hebrews 4:15. Uh, he suffered, but yet without he lived like last, like us, but yet without sin. Then um, the fact that he is separated from sinner means that he ascended to heaven. Uh, that is also another meaning of being separated from from sinners. Then Jesus was exalted above the heavens is a concept that we see as one of his characteristics. And uh, the meaning of this is what I want to come to. It suggests that he is one with God. How? Because God is the only person described as uh, exalted above the heavens. In uh, Psalms 57, verse 5 and uh, verse 11. Also Psalms 108, verse 5. God is the one exalted above above the heavens. So we see this also a big side of Jesus. Then another characteristic is that Jesus was fully human but without sin. I think this uh, I wrote here is as, it's as if uh, it's a, a concept we have heard of uh, initially among these other characteristics but if you, if you can read this in Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 to 16 and Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. I think then we can conclude that therefore Jesus is our example. He lived like us and shows us how to run the race of life. And that we can also look at in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Jesus being our example. We too can reflect his character as, uh, as holy, innocent, undefiled, unstained, and separated from what? From sin. Yes. Thank you very much. We have come to the end. Maybe uh, your final remark, JJ. You have a final remark you can make just for a few seconds. Okay. In, in the courts above, Christ is pleading for his church, pleading for those he has paid the redemption price of his blood. Centuries, ages can never lessen the efficacy of his atoning sacrifice. Neither life nor death, height nor death, can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Not because we hold him so firmly, but because he has held us so fast. If our salvation depended in our own efforts, we could not be saved. But it depends on who is behind all promises. Our grasp on him may seem feeble, but his love is that of an older brother. So long as we maintain our union with him, no one can pluck, at, pluck us out of his hand. Thank you very much. Uh Viewers, we have come to the end of our discussion this morning. I now request uh, Brother uh, Sami Methusela to pray uh, for us, to do the last prayer. Let's pray. Eternal Father, we thank you for your goodness and even for your love. Our desire is that we may emulate your example for us and may you teach us as you order our steps. This day, may your will abide with us, my prayer and desire, in Jesus' name.